So um, I do hope that we enjoyed the last session. I just wanted to quickly touch on something about the unpaid internships, because I'm currently enrolled in an unpaid internship in one of the radio stations here in Toronto. And when I first heard about the fact that uh, internships are unpaid, I thought it was spooky. I was upset. But I have learned a lot in the eight weeks that I have been there, although there are just two black people in the whole newsroom which is annoying, but I have learned a lot and being at this workshop today has also um, opened up my head to a couple of things that I've been doing wrong. And um, I still believe that uh, we need that opportunity to get our foot in the door. So that unpaid internship that I am doing, I believe might be my foot in the door. Another thing is for those of us that are in colleges, universities, our professors are also very key. Because like uh, she said, like Yalda said, who you know matters in the media industry everywhere. Even in Nigeria, who you know in the industry matters a lot. So your professors are very, very key because they know everybody. One call, your CV is on the table. One call from Paula Todd to Tim Abbott. Hi, I, this uh, CV is on the table. Do I hire this person? Might get you hired even if you know nothing. So I just wanted to briefly say that. Our next presenter uh, is uh, Nicholas Kiong. Am I pronouncing your name? Perfect. Um, he's a reporter with the Toronto Star. Um, he writes about immigration, refugee, and diversity issues. Uh, he has been honored with the Online Journalism Award, and his work has been recognized by Urban Alliance on Race Relations and the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers. Um, Nicholas Kiong identifies as Canada's longest-serving immigration reporter. He's going to be talking to us today about giving a voice to the voiceless and advanced reporting. I hope we enjoy. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? It's not the warmest day this winter. Uh, thanks for coming out to this workshop. I really appreciate it. Uh, so f before we start the formal presentation, I just want to you know, tell you a little bit more about my uh, story. I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and I spent my first 19 years of my life in Hong Kong. And I then uh, attended university in um, the US, University of Massachusetts. I don't have a background in journalism. My degree was in, uh, I did double major in psychology and communications, mass communications, advertising. And uh, when I came to Canada, um, after getting my university degree, uh, I also uh, endured a lot of uh, challenges uh, that I'm sure some of you have experienced. I spent my first year working uh, in a food court in Sherway Garden, doing dishes, uh, working as a counter help. And then I got the opportunity to um, land a job at Sing Tao Daily, a Toronto Chinese language paper. Uh, I was there for three years as a general assignments reporter, uh, covering crimes, court, and um, metro hall um, politics. and. Uh, that was a very interesting experience because out of a sudden, you know, you came from the privileged, you know, to someone in unknown um, in a new country. But that actually, that three years working at Sing Tao uh, prepared me uh, to my next journey um, at the star. I always tell people I probably is the luckiest uh, um, immigrant journalist in Canada because I, one, I never thought of becoming a journalist, but I really found journalism. Uh, by errors, you know, Sing Tao was just looking for someone who is bilingual, uh, had, you know, doesn't require any uh, journalistic background and experience. And, um, and I spent three years there, and then because of my earlier, uh, um, because of my work at Sing Tao, I came across uh, reporters from, uh, from Toronto Star, and I helped them at the time, you know, unfortunately, there were quite a number of high-profile crimes, um, um, gun violence in the Chinese community, so I actually worked side by side and helped some of the Star reporters on their coverage as well. And um, so someone told me, you know, there's actually an internship program at the Star, have you thought about trying? 
Um, so I put in my resume and uh, uh, never thought about, you know, English being my second language. Never thought about I would have the opportunity to work for Canada's largest mainstream newspaper. Um, but the, again, the three years you know I spent at Singtao was really important because that gave me the not just the basic journalistic training, but also in terms of getting to know to you know this new country. Uh, because I cover crime stories, I know oh there's actually a, a police services board is being appointed by you know with appointees by the government. You know I understand there are three levels of governments in Canada, and actually what jurisdictions, each level of government has. Like it gave me the basic uh, knowledge of how Canada works. And, but what was interesting was my shift from working for an ethnic newspaper to working for a mainstream newspaper. Essentially, you know, it's interesting when I started as, as the Toronto Star, I was dealing with the same people, you know, the same uh, media relations officers at the government, at the police, uh, people in courts. But because now, you know, I'm wearing the tag representing the Toronto Star, it gave me the, the, the esteem, the, the belief, the confidence that I never had before when I was at Singtao. And, you know, people returned my calls much quicker, for sure. And I mattered more. And I think, you know, if you looked at the, the outline of uh, my story, and I think that's how I became from a voiceless, voiceless journalist to someone who can make a difference. And um, it's interesting, when I was at Singtao, I was trying to bring Canada, information about Canada, news about Canada, to the Chinese community. But my role also shifted, reversed, you know, when I joined Singtao, you know, in the opposite. My expectation was to bring news of the Chinese community to um, the Canadian readers. Um, what, what was also um, very interesting was um, the, uh, sorry, I'm just, about, about that shift, you know, to, to my role, how that's changed. When I first started, you know, I was very lucky, another, you know, coincidence that I came to Canada in the 90s at a time when there, Canada, you know, jammed up the annual immigration level. So um, one of the largest source countries was China. That's also, it helped me landing my job at the Star because they felt they needed someone who can speak the language, can write the language, can tap into the community. And my three years at Singtao already helped me build up those networks within the Chinese community. Um, about the voiceless and the Star's liberalism, Everyone defines um, voiceless differently. And, um, but to me, essentially, it means, you know, this group include uh, all marginalized groups, whether it's racially, you know, whether it's, you know, religious minorities, sexual minorities, indigenous people, uh, people in the, uh, who are um, with disabilities, and those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, one of the main reasons, I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, their voices are not heard by the mainstream media because, you know, uh, there's a lack of representation, primarily in the manage at the management level. And so, you know, a lot of the managers, they lived, they have lived a very, uh, in a bubble, in a somewhat privileged life. Uh, in Canada, and you know, they have very little exposure or interactions with, you know, members of those marginalized groups. The, the, the definition of mainstream actually, you know, I think has blurred, you know, over the years, especially when it comes to uh, racial diversity, because of the racial diversity and also religious diversity. You know, probably back, you know. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, when people think of mainstream as, you know, white Canadians, Anglo-Saxon Canadians, Christians. But, you know, with immigration, you know, um, especially since the 90s, now, you know, we have, you know, in some municipalities, some cities in Canada, uh, 
visible minorities actually, um, for example, in a, in a town like a city now, in the city of Markham now, you know, over 50% of um, their residents actually immigrants. And uh, I think it's as, you know, high level of visible minorities as well. Um, because of the lack of representation at the management level, you know, a lot of times decisions on stories are made by a very homogeneous group of managers who have very little exposures. You know, what the issues that matter to you and I, especially on immigration fronts or in terms of um, um, employment, may not be on their radar screen. And so often, if you look at the coverage in newspapers, you know, it's you know, the stories that, you know, it's not like, you know, immigrants only, uh, you know, care about immigration issues. Your kids go to school, so you care about education, you care about health care, all these changes. But I think on top of those, you know, mainstream, mainstream issues, you know, we also have, you know, things that, you know, that you and I care more about. And, but when you look at the, the coverage, a lot of times, you know, it's, you know, who gets heard in the mainstream media is, you know, who is more media savvy. Okay, I know who to call, I know which email to, to, uh, to send my concerns to. And, uh, you know, they would respond immediately, you know, most of the times because, you know, it comes down to media savviness. And um, so who gets heard is who knows how to use the system just like everything else, right? No surprise. Um, Star, you know, has been known for its progressiveness and we have always been criticized and described as, you know, the red star with, even though our logo is blue, as you <laughs> noticed, uh, but we have always been described as uh, the red star with a bleeding heart. Um, in our newsroom, we actually, I don't know, like, you know, because I think each organization, news organization is structured differently, but at the star, you know, in our newsroom, we actually divided um, editors and reporters by what we call by pods, it's a pod systems, and the team, you know, that we ha would have like a bureau pod, meaning those who cover Queens Park provincial politics, uh, federal politics, city hall politics, would all be belong to that one pod. And the group that I belong to is called the Social Justice Pod Team. And we have workplace and wealth reporter, uh, you know, who covers about um, employment issues faced by the working class, for example. We have a social justice reporter who covers, you know, about access to health care, um, access to uh, social services, um, uh, Ontario Works program, uh, and I cover immigration, uh, refugee issues, and we also have an affordable housing reporter belonging to our team. Again, you know, we look at these stories through the lens of social justice. I think that's a new interesting perspective that speaks to the progressiveness of the, the, uh, of the paper. And um, a lot of times, you know, uh, we um, at the Star, uh, we've, sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. We've also had a diversity committee on staff in the newsroom made up of about 12, 13 people who, uh, you know, who care about, you know, um, uh, diversity issues and who also would from time to time critique our own stories, you know, to see how some of the marginalized groups are being presented, reflected in the paper, uh, and also how diversity uh, uh, is manifested in the paper. For example, you know, so often we would call experts uh, for, you know, economists, uh, researchers, uh, professors, um, scientists for comments. So how many women did we actually call as a source, as an expert, in, as a voice in those stories? Uh, how many people from an, uh, a visible minority background that we interview? How many photos of a minority person we presented? Uh, I know, you know, some people may criticize the stars as being politically too politically correct. But if, you know, we don't make an, an a conscious effort, you know, some of those uh, reality would not change. And I, I, t I, I too totally believe that, 
you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, it comes down to exposure uh, for our Canadian readers, you know, any, like, the media is actually that platform and forum for us to get to know our neighbor. And it just happens that our new neighbors are people from, maybe some of them from drastically different backgrounds, but all we share is, you know, humanities, I, I feel. So what is news and what is not? Um, in general, like, you know, um, in our newsroom, in our coverage, we have some, you know, um, uh, categorizations of you know what news a news story falls under one that's breaking news you know that everyone else would cover like a car accident you know the, the awful uh, snowstorm that we had early last week um, and you know some emotional stories that you know uh, not necessarily a tear a tear jerkers but but it's the stories that people can relate to at, the, at an emotional level. And uh, I did a story, for example, last year about this Saudi Arabian woman who was stuck somewhere else looking for Canada's, uh, for asylum, claiming that you know, she was uh, abused by her parents because of her religious background. And yes, you, know, you look at that story as an individual story, but at you know a higher level, you know it also stories is a story that resonates for to to uh, women who have had that experience of uh, feeling um, uh, marginalized. Uh, so uh, another type of story we call it inside the curtain. Essentially, uh, is you know they are the stories that actually. Um, explain to readers what happened behind the doors. Uh, for example, um, I did a story about human smuggling, uh, you know, um, um, operation by an immigration consultant. And the story, you know, focused on what happened behind the curtains. You know, you know a lot of times we hear about human smuggling, but what exactly, how they actually worked, you know, how, you know, um, uh, someone who's being smuggled, you know, you know, uh, went through the system, when, what the journey was like, what the experience was like. So that's an example of inside the curtain story. Uh, but essentially, you know, uh, I assume, you know, uh, the functions of new stories is to, you know, to, to help people relate to one another and to keep them informed. Um, So why, you know, not all those uh, voice, voices people get to see their stories published? Um, again, partially it's because of, you know, more homogeneous management, but also what I find interesting is, is universally people think that their story is the most important story. I'm sure you have that experience. Um, and there are so many factors, you know, you know, depends on the timing, the, whether something is newsy or not, you know, a story that, you know, would have been just, you know, be in the junk box one day, you know, just because of the coronavirus, you know, outbreak, for example, it became a oh, very important story, right? So it's timing, it's, it's all very uh, important. Um, the barriers that I've encountered, you know, and inside and outside of the newsroom when it comes to covering the stories of the voiceless is, you know, uh, it's not always the case, but sometimes, you know, it has to do with, a lot of times, actually, it, it has to do with language barriers for me, not for the, the subjects of the interviews. Um, you know, we, as you know, um, generally the media industry is not doing particularly well because of the internet. No one actually wants to pay for news and information anymore. And so we don't have a budget for interpreters. Um, we don't have the budget to have public documents, court documents uh, translated. Um, and in terms of culture, um, I cover, you know, mainly stories involving newcomers and a lot of them from different cultures. Um, they came from regimes, you know, where there's very little freedom of press, freedom of expression. So it's really hard to convince them to talk to the media, let alone to have their names used, have their photos taken. I find in generally there's a big difference in terms of the approach to news. Um, 
I can only speak to the, um, my experience in Hong Kong and Canada. Here I find in the West, you know, you need to identify the person, photos, very important. And there's the openness um, to, um, um, to talk to the press. Um, I can give you an example, you know, and this is real. Like I've had received, I have received calls uh, from time to time from people calling, you know, I want to tell you my story. And how much do you charge to run my story? Um, I never expected that. Like even in Hong Kong, you know, you know, there was still freedom of the press. And I think that speaks volume, you know, when you get a call like that. And it's not just one or two calls, but you know, I would say you know, uh, several over the year. So um, I, I do feel there's a lot need to be done. You know, media workshops that's actually for communities, newcomer communities, about how, or, or in general to the Canadian public, about you know, to educate them, inform them about media savviness. I just you know even like basic things like distinguishing fake news from real news, how you source your information, all these I find very um, important works. Um, and also another issue is about gatekeepers. I'm sure you, you know, in your respective community, you always have, have those self-acclaimed community leaders who speak for the entire community. Um, so, you know, always, you know, I have to be cautious of, you know, getting to know the community and talking to as many people from the community as possible to know who the players are and you know, what interests they represent, what's their agenda. Um, so that's how you feel sometimes, you know, you have to work an extra mile to actually to, because you know, I don't know everything about a community, about their history, about their politics, about their dynamics. Um, so, but you only have so limited time to, uh, to 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 um, learn, you know, to be up to speed, to get to know a community, uh, in a very short time. And another thing is, you know, never lose that, you know, um, lose the sight that about the diversity within a diversity. Because at the end of the day, even though someone look, you know, someone looks brown, someone looks yellow, someone looks black, at the end of the day, we are all each, you know, an individual. And um, we, we have to be always cautious of that. And also, uh, you know, just another example, you know, about um, um, earlier, you know, when, when we talked about, sorry, I'm backtracking a little bit. When we talk about, you know, the, the you know, what, what is news and what is not news. Um, recently, how many of you actually aware of the recent uh, controversy in Markham about the, the flag raising uh, protocols? Uh, so, okay, good. So um, there was, you know, this, you know, a lot of municipalities, you know, have had these debates whether, you know, we should raise the national flags of another country uh, in Canada at City Hall, um, even the, the flags of a totalitarian regimes, you know, just at the request of their, their, their nationals in Canada. Should we or should we not? Um, to me, you know, as, as an immigrant, I think that's a, you know, uh, someone who actually uh, pays a lot of attention to um, human rights issues. To me, you know, that's a big deal. Like, uh, is raising the flag an endorsement of the regime's, you know, uh, oppression? Um, but, you know, when that story actually, you know, idea, you know, uh, bounced through different editors in the newsroom, you know, no one actually pick up, no one is actually interested. And, you know, uh, I think partially there's actually this mentality is the less you do, the less likely you make a mistake. Especially when sometimes, you know, on the controversial issues, you don't want to become that story, you know, for, for other media. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes, you know, it takes some sort of assertiveness to actually tell these very controversial and sensitive stories. So, um, um, on how to build trust and bridges, I think one of the, the key thing is to check your personal views and um, values at the door. As someone who grew up, you know, I came from a working class 
background. Uh, my, my father was a carpenter, my mom was a seamstress. And, um, you know, we, you know, growing up, you know, you always have all these values that you feel, oh, someone is on welfare, got to be, you know, someone who's lazy. Um, you know, someone, uh, for example, you know, uh, someone from the LGBTQ community, there's something morally wrong with this person. Um, you know, someone who is disabled, you know, uh, yeah, they need extra help from people. But you just, you know, I think, you know, when you cover, you know, the stories of the voices of the marginalized, you really have to check your presumptions um, and assumptions at the doors, go in with an open mind and not to be judgmental. One th I think one, uh, once, I f you know, one very important skills for journalists, I think sort of sometimes has been lost in a fast-paced uh, society is the listening skills, especially I think for, you know, uh, electronic media like videos, uh, uh, sorry, um, TV and radios, they only have like 90 seconds to tell a story, so they just ask the question, okay, just answer me the yes or no questions, I don't have time to listen to your live story. <laughs> um, so, so I, I just feel, you know, the listening skills is really important, you know, try not to interject, you know, when someone is talking to show respect, you know, it's, it's all those little things when you interview someone whose voice is already, you know, um, you know, not very confident in their own voice um, to share their stories with you. Um, given that a lot of, uh, the, the, you know, my subjects, they're not familiar with, they're not media savvy, they don't know how Canadian media works, my approach is always, you know, to explain to them, you know, sometimes with the help of their immigration lawyer, their refugee lawyer, uh, with a friend who can speak English, uh, with a social worker uh, in the presence of them to, 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 for the interview. And also before we, before the interview, always explain to them about, you know, what this story is about, uh, the kind of questions that I would ask you. I do need to make them know, you know, you are talking to um, a, a Toronto Star reporter. I do need to give your name, use your name in the story, and hopefully you would agree to be photographed. And we also set the parameters of the, the interviews, okay, what I can ask and what I cannot ask, just to give them that comfort level of sharing with you that they will be respected. You're not going to, um, uh, you know, ambush them but you know, you're being upfront and transparent with them. To build that trust, I think it's truly important. And on the flip side, I do need to tr be able to trust them <laughs> as well, because so often, you know, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that I think it goes both ways. You know, on one hand, you know, I'm you know, eager to tell the stories, but at the same time, you know, um, some, you know, as I said, you know, there are community gatekeepers that I always have to be aware of, I always have to be aware of, you know, who think that, oh, because, you know, you represent a mainstream media, you know nothing about my com community, so I can totally take advantage of your ignorance. <laughs> that happens too, it happens, you know, as I said, it happens both ways. So, where do you get that balance? Like, for me, you know, um, not a lot of reporters uh, actually know that, but because I've been covering immigration refugee issues for the last 17 years, so I've developed some of these um, skills and know how the, the immigration and refugee system works. So um, I would ask, you know, for, you know, documentations. It always helps to have, like, court documents, to have tribunal documents, at least, you know, not necessarily, you know, these are the facts, you know, because they are documented by the government, by the lawyers, by the court. But at the very least, it's something that you can fall back on to verify the story that you are being told. And also there's, you know, something uh, called the media consent form by, you know, um, from uh, immigration, from the Federal Immigration Department and by the Immigration Refugee uh, Board as well as the Canada Border Services agency where, you know, I would have the subjects, okay, you want your story being told, but I do need to access your file. So I would have them sign that consent so I could actually access their immigration and refugee files. Um, there have been times once I sent the, the consent form to the person or persons, 
you never hear back from them. <laughs> I think that's an indication, you know, sort of like how my vetting system and screening system works for me. So yes, we're here to tell the stories of the voiceless, but we also have a very robust screening process to make sure, you know, you are who you are and your story is what it is. Um, the writing part is also very important. In, generally, in, in general, in our reporter's handbook, we can never share a pre-published story with anyone outside of the newsroom. And I would assume that's a universal practice. Um, and, but a lot of times, you know, because people have voiced this, you know, whether it's you know, a drug addict to share the story, or someone you know, who's in um, the sex trade to share your story, or immigrants, refugees who share stories, they're all afraid of you know, any repercussions by speaking out uh, and sharing their stories. So sometimes we do make an exception to, we never share you know, anything in writing, but we would share what we are, not word for word, but what we are going to be attributing to them, you know, what part in the story. So we're going to mention this about your experience. We're going to give this quotes that you told me last time. At least they know what to expect and they don't get shocked and would never trust the media again. That's the last thing that, you know, you want to uh, see happening. And during the writing part, you know, it's interesting, so often we, you know, because of our assumption as a writer, um, we, we would, um, we don't realize, you know, uh, the power of a word sometimes, you know, you think, oh, you know, because, you know, I'm sure you have this experience. You know, you don't want to repeat the same word over and over in your story. You try to fudge it, you try to, come up with, you know, um, other words that may have similar meanings and connot but, but different connotations, right? That may mean something similar, but, you know, it's subtly. There's su the subtleties of the language. So it ended up, you know, you, you know, in the eyes, because, you know, the subject who is being featured in your story, to him, that's his or her story. So they would dissect every single word that you put into their story. And so, you know, we always have to be very sensitive to, for every word you put, you know, you really think about, you know, does it really truly represent, you know, what the person's story is? And I would always, you know, um, um, during my interview, I would always play the devil's advocate and I would explain to them, okay, because sometimes when you challenge, you know, ask a difficult question, the subject will feel that you don't believe in their story, you're challenging them. Um, but I always, you know, try to ask, you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, so this is what is behind my question. It's not to try to put them off guard, but, you know, you tell them, you explain to them, this is my job. Yes, you know, I'm telling your story, but I'm at the same time, you know, I would let the story speak for itself. It's not like, you know, the story is necessarily here to advocate for you, but it's to explain your situation to our, to, to our readers. I think the more explaining you can do, uh, the better, like in terms of the, the communication. So where do you find the voiceless people? <laughs> um, increasingly, we don't actually I think generally the media doesn't cover individual stories as much as we used to. When I say individual story, meaning a story about one person, you know, just one character story. But we, because, you know, we feel like we need to reach out to a broader audience, we try to expand the scope of the story so other people can relate to the story. So instead of, you know, uh, highlighting one person's story, we're going to, we are, most of the time now we flip the story to see, okay, this is the person's story. What's the bigger implication? Uh, is, it a, is there a systemic issue here? So more other people, they look at the story, oh, it's just about one person, I don't care, right? It, why does it matter to me? But instead, when you, t when you turn it into a bigger story about how the welfare system fails this particular group of people, how this new immigration program disadvantage um, others, 
um, you actually you know can bring more people into the uh, readers to the story. Um, one example that you know um, I recently did a story about um, a mother of Muslim background who filed a complaint to the TTC. Um, alleging the, the bus driver being um, uh, um, uh, racist because you know she was getting off the bus and the bus driver would not let one of her two kids off the bus so she she's on the sidewalk with one child and the other child was still stuck in the bus and the bus driver would not stop and let to let the girl get off um, is an individual story about this one family uh, experience, but we also use that story to look at you know our um, uh, the, the 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 TTC policy in terms of you know where they can stop. Do they can they only stop at a bus stop or can they stop at the request of the driver? And we also look at you know another bigger issue about the experience of. Um, hijab wearing Muslim women, you know, in their um, use of public transit. Uh, and, you know, the fact that, you know, some of the, the Muslim women actually said that, you know, they have had experience of a bus skipping, a bus skipping their stop, a bus that's half empty skipping their stop, and they believe that's a result of uh, racism. So, you know, it's about, you know, expanding, you know, an individual story uh, to a bigger picture story. Um, it's really, you know, as I said earlier, you know, where do you find these story? Uh, you just have to be proactive. And I think as, you know, um, someone from different cultural communities, we have the advantage of knowing best what's happening in our communities. Um, uh, the issues that matter to our communities that, you know, the mainstream media actually is not aware of. And um, we have the contacts um, that we can, you know, um, certainly, you know, uh, have the advantage to tell those stories. And one of the, the interesting thing, too, is, you know, as you may be aware of, you know, there are, you know, I think the general trend of the, 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 um, the news industry news media industry is there are fewer, like everything else, there are fewer and fewer full-time staff jobs. But the flip side is there are also more opportunities for uh, freelance works to make story pitch. I think, you know, one of the things, you know, maybe Seneca, you know, can offer a course really helpful is how to be a freelancer. You know, I think as a future career trend, um, you know, how you make a story pitch, how do you write that pitch, um, you know, who to call to make your story pitch. Because definitely, you know, for example, at the Star right now, we, our core operation is on news. News and news. And, um, you know, um, we used to have, for example, uh, movie reviewers. Um, we have, like, live section reporters to report on lifestyles. We have music uh, uh, critic. We had um, food restaurant critic reviewers, and now you know all everyone just works on news. We you know and all those copies in the other sections primarily they come from the wire surfaces. Um, so, sorry, they all come from wire surfaces, and or they come from a freelance writer. So definitely, you know, I think you know a lot of. You know, it's a matter of how we take advantage of our expertise, right, to make those story pitch and to tell those stories for the, for the otherwise uh, voiceless. Um, some other means that you could discover, you know, the, uh, these stories uh, and find the voiceless is, you know, uh, for me, I cover immigration and refugee stories, so I count on a lot, you know, on, on lawyers, immigration lawyers, advocacy groups. Uh, I would check the um, federal court documents because immigration is actually a federal jurisdiction, so I would religiously check on interesting, uh, extraordinary uh, court immigration uh, decisions from the court. 
you know, we, with uh, the immigration departments, the refugee board, uh, Canada border service agencies, I would check, you know, you know, constantly, you know, checking into their databases because, you know, I'm sure, you know, you're aware uh, a lot of stories these days because of technologies, you know, they are digital stories that focus on data analysis. We actually, in our newsroom, we have four uh, data journalists. So that's another future trend that I find, you know, in overall the journalism industry is getting into is uh, data. Um, also, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, we all very... Did you define that? Uh, define... Data journalists? Data journalists, for me, is you get a lot of raw data and you crunch down the numbers and spot um, trends, spot correlations between these numbers, and then tell a story about the implications. I don't know. What's the right answer? <laughs> okay. Is there actually, I don't know. Is that how generally you guys define it? Yeah, okay. Do, do we have any data journalists here? On some, oh, wow, okay. Good. Yes. The, the challenges? Yeah. Um, the challenges is, you know, people would only tell you things they want you to hear. <laughs> and, you know, that same for, you know, a refugee claimant, a failed refugee claimant, that same for someone who failed an immigration application, same for the lawyers, um, same for uh, government officials. They only want to tell you things that they want you to hear. That's one. Uh, a second challenge is, you know, if you'll ask for numbers, documentations. Um, what is interesting, because, you know, from time to time, you know, we cover international news stories as well. So mainly, you know, uh, dealing with American officials. Generally, you know, when you are, you know, looking for documents, you know, government information from American officials, they're much quicker to respond, especially in the justice system. Um, except, you know, when it's, you know, I, I deal, usually I deal with ICE, the um, Immigration Enforcement, it, sorry, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, and, or sometimes, you know, uh, even, the, you know, um, FBI and CIA, they're quite, surprisingly, they're quite, <coughs> you know, responsive to Canadian media requests. And uh, dealing with the immigration department, especially the Canada Border Services Agency, you know, you put in a request, and by the time they get back to you, the story is no longer a, a new story <laughs> anymore. That's a big, big challenge. Um, yeah, but, you know, uh, because so many, so many times, you know, there's a, a breaking news story, for example, involving deportation of someone, you know, I would do my due diligence by sending in the consent form of the deportee into the government. It would take them, you know, days to process. But already, other media already jumped the gun and reported that story on the first day. But by the time, you know, but we made the choice not to run a story without, without verifying the story from the officials, to be fair, you know. Um, so by the time we got a response from the Canadian officials, we got the rest of the real story. And I would feel relieved that, thank God, we didn't advocate for the wrong person. Right? So I think, again, you know, it goes both ways. I think it also relates to, you know, the allegations of fake news. Um, we, you know, the criticisms, the criticisms that we face, you need to go the extra mile, you know, the ethics, and then how you strike that balance between getting the stories out at the, at the, as the first media, getting the story out and still be accurate. That's always a constant struggle, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the, um, any other questions for the time being? Yep. How do you, um, oh, thank you. Hello? Oh, yes. Um, how do you, it, I, I think there's a longer process to talk about this, but mm. fact checking. Can you talk about fact checking and how your sources will have to deal with fact checking who might not be used to that kind of thing, or as reporters, what, how fact checking works in Canada? When I first joined the STAR in late 90s, 
my story would go through three, four copy editors. Now, maybe one. We had a library. Uh, the librarians would help us with the research to make sure, you know, that's part of the, the fact-checking effort. When I joined the STAR, there were 12 librarians. Now we have two. And um, so now I feel like it falls on individual reporters to do all those fact checking and the one copy editor who edited the story to ask the right questions. And we, I certainly feel like in my 23 years at the Star, my workload has like gone off the roof. Because of that, you know, there's also more administrative work. Okay, you have to help promote the Star stories on social media. At the Star, we run a, um, for me primarily, you know, uh, every day, you know, I have to post stories, like mainly immigration stories and refugee stories on my Twitter feed and on the Facebook, the Star's Facebook immigration group. And um, that's something that, you know, I never had to worry about. You know, in the old days, I just go talk to people, come back, file the story, that's the end of the day, and I go home. But now it's like, you know, just you go nonstop. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know whether I answer your questions, but another thing that I personally try to do is based on, you know, it's not an, a perfect system, but try to rely on public documents. That's a safeguard. I wouldn't say that's ideal, but that's a safeguard. Uh, and, but it's interesting too, like I think not only, um, you know, we have fewer layers of fact checking, but also the fact that the story, um, the, the expectations of stories in the meantime, actually, you know, the kind of scrutiny because of the allegations of fake news and whatnot in the social media age, you know, not only we have fewer fact checkers within the system, but we also have higher scrutiny in the meanwhile. So you, you see the gaps, it's actually bigger. But the good thing is I think sometimes, you know, we, all, we cannot always count on internet, but some, there's some convenience, you know, it's one tool for, for reporters to do their job uh, by using the internet is easier. I remember in the old days you have to go to library, to, to the library to actually do some research work, right? Sometimes, but now, you know, you, a lot of things actually at your fingertip, potentially, but, um, but there was one story a um, few years ago, not few, more than about 10 years ago, when the internet was, you know, really booming and starting. Um, there was an intern who did a story and counting on uh, some information in Wikipedia. Oh. <laughs> I think either his, his contract was terminated after the publication of the story or it wasn't, um, he wasn't hired among the, the, the group that, that ended up being hired, but, but that was a mistake. But you know, there are so many pitfalls like that, right? And, and yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> And I'm sure you, you know, you ha you, most of you ha may have more experience than I do, would know best. Um, so somewhat related to, to that as well is, you know, uh, so what drives news in Canadian mainstream media? Uh, subscriptions, subscriptions, subscriptions. Um, a lot of times, you know, when you, when you run stories about, you know, the, the, for the voiceless people, yes, you may earn views, but it doesn't earn you subscriptions, so it does not help. And it's a challenge, you know, for a progressive media like the Toronto Star. Um, unlike the Globe, you know, they have a lot of corporate subscribers, for example. People subscribe, subscribe to their business news primarily. Um, and they can afford to pay for the subscriptions, but how do you expect some a homeless person to subscribe to the Star, for example? It's just impossible. And also because we write about the stories uh, of these uh, voiceless people or the marginalized groups, we are also essentially competing with the ethnic media outlets, 
which is very vibrant. I think last I checked, we have more, just in Ontario, we have more than 400, not, not online, but you know, just you know, uh, media outlets, ethnic media outlets, 400. Uh, and also we're competing with, you know, with the internet, we're competing with you know, global media, Meaning, you know, um, you know, I think for a lot of, for example, for a lot of immigrants, they care a lot about what's happening to their loved ones back home. So we're competing with those outlets, you know, somewhere in the Philippines, somewhere in China, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, but then another challenge is how do we write in a very local way and that story can still resonate with people, with everyone. I, I think that's still a constant challenge that we do not you know, necessarily have an answer to. Uh, and uh, you know, so another thing about you know, drive, you know, subscriptions, you know, trying to you know, get more subscriptions, you know, you know, people we write about, well, I, the people, you know, some of the people I write about, they don't speak English, they don't read English and they have no money to subscribe. Like how, you know, it's not sub, you know, sustainable um, in, in a way. Um, but what is fortunate that, you know, I don't know whether you've heard about, you know, the founder of the Toronto Star is someone by the name of Joseph Atkinson. So even today, we still live by the principles that is, you know, that he, you know, when he established the Star, you know, these are the founding principles is to entrenched you know, in the newsroom, uh, we want to build a strong, united, and independent Canada. We want to advocate for social justice, and we want to advocate for individual and civil liberties. And we still abide by those principles today. So the, the outlook um, is a very difficult time for every single media. I think the same, I don't know, like, is it just in Canada, in North America, or is it around the world? Like about the very survival? Is it around the world? Yeah. It makes you wonder why people still get into journalism. <laughs> why bother? So, so Nicholas, I got a question. Yes. And you just kind of sparked. Um, so I get it that some people don't have access to voice their own voice and become part of the wider media, right? But you just mentioned that some people don't even have access to the media. Um, and I'm not even sure how to voice my question myself because, you know, with, without even the, the media outlets, um, you know, be, thinking of being a barrier, right? So th there's a barrier that they don't reflect everyone because the voices of, you know, immigrants or the wider community is not reflected in, in, in their own voice as a media outlet. But here we have now a, a cohort of people or a certain demographic that just can't afford to access it or they don't read it. So it, it's a lot bigger than just the fact that my voice or I am not reflected in, in, in this media or in, in this publication. I can't even access it. I can't read it. So it, it really goes much, much deeper. Any idea if that's something that the, you know, the STAR or any other media organization is tracking? Do they care? What I find interesting, because at one, at one point I actually brought up the idea to the, news, um, to the newsroom. Because at, at the STAR we do have an education program like where we reach out to uh, um, high schools and colleges, universities and offer um, subscriptions at a discount rate as one way to, to make it more accessible. Uh, so at one point, you know, I actually proposed, you know, maybe we can, you know, start doing workshops to, about media savviness to different communities. Um, necessarily, not necessarily, you know, to, you know, as part of the strategy to attract readers, but just for the sake of, you know, having a, you know, media, um, you know, you know, a, 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 a society that's, you know, um, educated when it comes to be, become more critical, you know, of medias and information they receive through the media. But the argument was by organizing this kind of workshops to different um, ethnic communities, cultural communities, 
is the perceived um, conflict of interest. That's how it was explained to me at the time anyway, um, that we are, you know, it's already beyond the responsibility of a media organization. It's not just not the role of a media outlet to do that. That's how it was explained to me. And I honestly, I don't know, like, you know, whose responsibility? Is it some sort of like civic organizations? Um, is it, you know, um, a group like OCASI, the Ontario Council for Agency Serving Immigrants? Um, I, I don't know whose role, like, or is it, you know, should it be like, um, I don't know, like, I think it would be a one very nice elective mandatory college course that all like first year freshmen need to take, you know, media seminars. Um, but, you know, I don't, I know I'm you know, drifting away, like not answering your question because was, your question specifically, you know, about people who have language barriers or who cannot, you know, I think that's the main part, right? Well, even to some aspect, almost every large media outlet or organization is only in English. And so it's only serving the mainstream. And yeah. so the, the, the message that they're putting out there is if you don't speak my language, you don't get to be included. And so you see a lot of organizations, uh, ethnic organizations, create their own media outlets. They, they have their own um, newspapers, their own whatever, right? Publications, great. But they never make it into the mainstream. And so there's this demographic that's not reflected. And so if I want to go to find out something about Canada, I have to go to one of the larger media outlets. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing anything to make me feel part of Canada. Because now I have to put on my white face and say, hey, I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's interesting. But I, I would think, why not have a revolving column where this time it's in Cantonese, then maybe in Arabic, then may, may, maybe in, you know, in, in, in Gujarati. I mean, just. Mm -hmm. it, we, we don't think like that, right? We just, I guess, do they not know that there's readership? Do they fear mm -hmm. that uh, they will lose readers? Uh, one uh, first thing uh, is, um, I'm sure you're aware of New York Times and BBC, they do have the Chinese language sites and other languages too. It's very costly. So I think at the time when the media is struggling financially. They just don't have the resources to do that. And, um, and I take your points that, you know, maybe we could have like a visiting, not visiting, but a revolving columns by different communities uh, to, to highlight feature issues that's important uh, to the uh, community. Um, I think that's possible, but again, you know, I just feel, um, what is interesting, something that I've heard from people um, over and over again in the last two years, you know, yes, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity in the media, primarily, you see it on TV, especially city TV, you see that kind of diversity. Um, and in, at a, but at, during a difficult financial time, it's interesting, when we talk about can, uh, diversity in Canadian journalism, I think the strongest push came when I was hired at the Toronto Star in the 90s, there was relatively more, you know, there, there were more resources to focus on diversity hiring. Uh, so, you know, during my time and after my time, you've seen, I've seen more uh, people from diverse background being hired in the mainstream media. Uh, but, you know, they, because they are more, they are the latest wave of employees jo joining the organization. In over the past, you know, decade or so, because of all the downsizing, they are also the first group that got let go as well. So, I think right now, like you know, we are seeing that almost like a reversal, like little, you know, very little attention paid to diversity. Um, so, you know, there is maybe more, you know, less diverse voices in the. And also less diverse voices in newsrooms. But one other thing too is um, um, in terms of the, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, diversity. About, you know, having that, you know, the, so it went back to, you know, having a more homogeneous voice now, like the way I look at it. 
Um, and also, oh, I remember now. So even when we talk about diversity, like, you know, I'm sure you have heard the terms coconut, bananas, um, not to belittle every individual's personal experience, but I feel like the immigrant, an immigrant Chinese life experience would be very different from a Chinese Canadian who was born and raised here. I think it's that diversity of perspectives, connections, um, and life stories would be different. And I, from what I know of, you know, if you looked at the many personalities in the print media and, me, uh, and uh, electronic media, you know, very few actually come from an immigrant background. You know, yes, you know, they have a brown face, they have a yellow face, they have a black face, but you know, black face not meaning uh, Trudeau, but um, <laughs> not referring to him. But, uh, but if you look at those diversity, you know, essentially they have the same Canadian perspective, right? Privilege. Um, it's all relative too, right? To them, you know, they feel they're less privileged and than their white Canadian colleagues, right? They have to work hard to get there, but they're still more privileged than the people who are not born here. Exactly. I think, and unfortunately, there's actually a hierarchy of privileges. thoughtful reporter thank you and from reading your work uh, and you're, you're a bit of a gentle spirit uh, gen journalists tend to be much more aggressive and but you know what the way I looked at it is not just because I cover immigration refugee issues but I think those should be the virtues that all journalists should have to do a good job I feel um, yes um, we have yeah, three other Not working. Yep. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, your work was something which we refer to often. So I've been reading you from about three, four years now, which is amazing privilege to hear you. Um, my question to you is, uh, you spoke about, and I'm working for a refugee organization and you do immigration uh, reporting. Uh, could you tell us uh, about how you create an atmosphere of sensitivity when you interview uh, your subjects? Because, uh, and I ask this question for a reason. Indra Nui says that immigrants tend have to work three times harder than the local population and immigrant women have to work five times harder. So in that mindset, when you go in as a journalist, you are eager or over eager or over zealous to get the material out of the person to write because you don't get such opportunities often. One tends to cross the line at that time. How do you prepare yourself and the circumstances around you uh, that you are able to do your bit but also not cross the line? Thank you. I think, I think first of all, you have to be accommodating in terms of, because they work many jobs, a lot of times, you know, the people who write about, they work many jobs. You know, I have done interviews at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, um, weekends. Um, you know, I don't, you know, you know, for example, like my colleague who cover education, healthcare, they talk to, you know, policymakers, politicians between nine to five. They talk to parents who maybe stay home parents, right? But for the subjects I write about, you know, unless, you know, they, they've been laid off, uh, or, you know, if, you know, even if they're not laid off, you know, they would be like, oh, I'm, I'm in an, an ESL class between nine and three. Can we do the interview? Can we meet after four, for example, right? So one, you try to be at their disposal, not to be an inconvenience, to be sensitive to their schedule. And, you know, you just go in, you know, I, I think to me it's just being respectful, like it's a basic human thing. Yeah, and you listen and you ask your questions. And um, yeah, like I, I, to me, like it's nothing really, you know, spectacular that I, I do. But, but those are just the things. And try, I think, you know, just try to be non-judgmental is truly important. Like as a reporter, you know, so you don't come in having this 
you know, this is the story that I'm going to deliver, but you come in, what is the story that I'm telling today, right? I think it makes a big difference. And so often you would uncover a story that you did not anticipate, which is a better story than what you expected. Yeah. Uh, someone there. Hi. In your articles for many years, oh, good. and Thank it's a you. pleasure to to see you. Uh, in this multicultural country and this multicultural city, uh, what is the criteria that you use to pick one story to tell? Because uh, we are surrounded for many cases, many stories from many communities. So. Uh, what is the, the criteria to pick what story to tell and to mm -hmm. prioritize mm -hmm. the, the content? I think, you know, the, the basic rule of thumb, one, I think, you know, I think this is universal. It doesn't matter which country you're in. You know, whenever there's an ordinary person who has done something extraordinary, that is a story. Like, for example, um, you know, um, a bystander, you know, went into a fire scene and rescued uh, a victim from the fire, that, you know, as an ordinary person doing something, you know, brave and extraordinary. That is a story. Or the other way around, when someone extraordinary do, uh, did something ordinary, uh, you know, if you, for example, if Trudeau actually goes to a uh, homeless shelter to serve breakfast on Thanksgiving for homeless people, like that would make a story every media would cover because you have an extraordinary person doing something a lot of volunteers, you know, would do like so. Um, but, go, but going back, you know, I think, you know, it goes by the same principles of newsworthiness, you know. It's breaking news, like people would like to know about what's happening, you know. I, you know, surprisingly, you know, if you look at, you know, the number of views and clicks, you know, uh, last week, a lot of people clicked on the the weather story. For example, people want to know what time you know the the snow storm is arriving, what time the freezing rain starting. Um, so breaking news, like you know. But I think it's harder for you know for for immigrate for immigration stories uh, to, to a multicultural multicultural story to fall into breaking news. I think it's harder to do. Uh, except you know when it's terrorism terrorism related or crime related, you know. Uh, something that is, you know, that would, you know, actually people can re re resonate at a, an emotional level. I think, you know, extraordinary thing like, you know, a story like recently we had um, someone who was um, convicted of crime graduating from law school, for example. Like this is, you know, it falls into that category of someone ordinary doing something, achieving something extraordinary, that criteria. But at the same time, um, it also, you know, there's this emotional response of, you know, that's an inspiration, right? I think if you have those qualities, it could help. And also, you know, when you think of, you know, newsworthiness, you know, um, explaining something that Canadian readers would not know about, uh, like, um, for example, the story of the Wuhan restaurant in Markham, right? The, the, just the, the name of the restaurant is Wuhan yeah. restaurant. And I think, you know, that's sort of, you know, um, interesting, like things that interest. My, 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 my guiding principle generally is, you know, if a story interests me, I, you know, I'm not a particularly extroverted person, but I feel I'm a, you know, somewhat interesting person. I like to think that. So if something interests me, like it would interest other people, I think, but I always explain to people at the end of the day that, you know, I, you know, it's always a hit and miss. I don't know whether, I, I, again, I think this is a universal issue, like in any other newsrooms around the world, like it's a hit and miss, right, whether a story get covered or not. Yeah. Am I correct? Okay. So, but, but those are sort of like my guiding principles, and that's another question. Hi. I'm uh, very privileged. I mean, you know, I'm still, I subscribe to Star. Thank you so, so much for contributing to my paycheck. And I really believe in the kind of journalism which John Star does. Yeah. Thank you.
it is a still old stock Canadian who writes policies, who decides what has to be done. Can the Canadian Fourth Estate, especially the journalist, or the media houses, can take on CRTC, do stories on them? Why it should be a white white boys club? Why there is no place going? I know for any diversity in why the N1H license for television has to be decided by them? Why can't they have more inclusion of you know, people of colors, of different diversity, you know, people like Derek, who's here for like 35 years, why can't they be part of it? And how do you get it? So, no, I'm just saying, so, you know, so can we step up the, uh, the level of journalism and question the policy makers? Thank you. Good. So uh, just a couple quick response. One is the star actually, I don't remember precisely when, we did run a few stories on um, board representation in general. And also, but also we have a sp uh, specific story on CRTC as well. Uh, that's my first response, I, but I think that's several years back, but we do have a recent, we, we had a recent story about board diversities, like the boardroom diversity. And the second thoughts I have is, compared to when I came to Canada, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a realist, I'm very pragmatic. Um, change really does not happen overnight. And I remember from, you know, even from when I uh, started, at the star in the late, you know, in 1997 until now, the, there has been, there have been a lot of improvements in terms of, you know, I, I remember, you know, back in t year 2000, we had the Beyond 2000 project, year round project, where we actually identified a lot of issues such as physicians driving cabs and, you know, people's credentials not being recognized and other, barriers and challenges faced by skilled immigrants. And today, do we still have those problems? Yes, we do. Uh, but now at least, you know, somewhat, you know, it's not like someone stay unemployed for five years before their first Canadian job, but now is they are in a job that's less commensurate to, you know, the skills. All I'm saying is, you know, progress have been made. Is it perfect? No. More work needs to be done? Yes. And media, certainly, you know, I think journalists have an important role to play. But given the current climate, financial, economy, I'm not very hopeful. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> yes, one more question. Just to, to answer also in accompaniment. I'm not sure if this is on or not, but uh, it's not. sorry, is that better? No, yep. no, I've, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, I think part to answer your question, sir, is that it's part of building a new ecosystem. You know, there's places like NCM or the Canadian Association of Journalists or places like this where you can be part of it and, and ultimately try to make that change. So I think that that's part of the answer. It's by no means the only answer, but I think, you know, um, change happens when people get together ultimately and, and, try, and try and do something different. Um, just beforehand, Nicholas, because you're really, you've done this, like you said, for 25 years. And I remember when I started out as a reporter, going to interview somebody who would be considered voiceless, whether it's a person with a disability, someone from a marginalized community, that can be very stressful for somebody, especially who's just starting out. And there's some people here who are just starting out in journalism. Um, what are some of the tips that you would offer to those individuals here today and online who are saying, I want to go out and I want to do this adventurous reporting and, and you know, talk to voiceless community or communities where there are people who are voiceless, but I, want, I don't want to do harm also by going in there and, and sort of, you know, being and, and doing, doing more harm than you would through journalism. Uh, so, 
I'd, I'd like some tips on how you'd prepare for an interview, things like that, something very practical to end the, this section off. I usually actually try to prepare myself with a lot of research uh, as much possible about an issue, about uh, the politics, about you know uh, the government policies, or uh, even searching the name of my subject to get a sense of who that person. I think the more prepared you are, the better going into an interview. Uh, and when you are with the person, you know uh, my approach again, you know just to sum up, I always you know try to set the parameters and make the person feel comfortable and being totally transparent and um, then when we you actually start the interview like you know really listen and don't show respect by not interrupting which I'm still at fault sometimes and uh, and then um, actually I wrote it down you know my tips at the end, for, for, for the end of my presentation um, and also, you know, pay a lot of attention to current affairs, whether locally, uh, nationally, internationally, because, you know, so often you only have like 10 minutes before you got parachuted to cover a story. So make sure, you know, this, again, it comes back to the preparedness. Um, and also diversity of perspectives. I find, you know, I hate reading one source story, like the entire story, only one person is being quoted. I really hate those stories because I think it's a disservice to your readers. Uh, so always try to include, you know, a diversity of perspectives. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily opposing perspectives, but different perspectives. And I find, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, the society has become more and more polarized because we only have one source stories, right? Because you have only one perspective. So either you are with the person, you are not, or you are not with the person. I think if we can allow readers to look at the same issue differently, diff with different perspectives, it would help those kind of communications. And, um, and also, I think something that, you know, especially editors are very, um, you know, bad for is I think we all have the tendency to try to want, or we, we have this longing to look at the world as black and white, but we all know that the world is not black and white, it's gray. So I think, you know, we really have to um, do a job, like, because, you know, so often my editors, the first question, so who's the villain in the story? Is it a TTC bus driver? Like, the villains, but you know what? The driver could have had a bad day, you know, like, I'm not trying to justify, you know, uh, these stories. But again, you know, our job is to not to judge, like to me anyway, but is to present the facts and let the readers make those decisions. Who's the bad guy here? Who's the good guy? Or it's all bad guys, right? You know, there could be a million options. So it's, our job is to, if given the space, the length that you have is to tell nuanced stories at the end of the day. Yes? Um, I, the formal presentation part is over, but I'm going to be around if you, you know, want to mingle and have other questions, feel free. So before Nicholas walks away, I do want to thank you, Nicholas, for spending your morning with us, enlightening us. So thank you so, thank you so much. So before we go to lunch, um, I think when we look at Nicholas and others like Nicholas who have actually uh, stepped up and broken through these barriers and, uh, you know, not only is it inspiring, but it also lets us know that it can be done. And this is why we're asking you to join us today. This is why we want you to see Joyita and Brent and talk to the mentors uh, during lunchtime because you can do it. We have to do it. Not you can, but you will. It's very important that you find out what it takes to uh, address the Canadian audience and then put yourself out there. It's never going to be a perfect situation and it's never going to be a perfect opportunity, but you get to make it. And once there are more people who reflect that voice, once we see that landscape is reflecting the diversity, this is when we can reclaim that identity and we, we, we bring in the inclusion that we need and that we are craving. Um, but it doesn't start with you just sitting in here. Really goes with the next steps of, okay, how do I do it and when do I start? And I say that you've already started because you've shown up today. So um, thank you so much. Yeah, I would love, sure.
Oh, can I just add one more quick thing? You know, just following up your comments is, I'm not a particularly. I'm not aggressive. That's why I have in my whole life I have only sent out one resume to the star and <laughs> nailed it. Um, I'm not a you know particularly aggressive person, but I think one quality that we all need to have is perseverance and persistence. I never take no for an answer and. Uh, for stories, when it comes to stories, always push and push, you know, you call a million times to get a comment, you email a million times, no comment, I knock on their door at home to get the story, to get the response. So I think it takes that same kind of perseverance and persistence to persevere. And good luck. And my contact information is actually on the, the at the bottom of the sheets. If you know, if in the future, if I can be of assistance, if you want some advice, you know, or you want to make a story pitch, feel free to contact me. My door is always open. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, loud uh, round of applause for Nicholas, please. <laughs>